Hi there, and welcome to our automation showdown session. Today, with the help of many demos, we are going to try and show you the concepts and differences between imperative and declarative coding. My name is Luke Dekens. Feel free to reach out to me via any of the social media links that you see here. And hello, I'm Kyle Ruddy. You can find me on most of the normal sites using the screen name KM Ruddy. Diving into our packed agenda here, we're first going to start off with a foundational layer of some concepts and, and definitions that we should probably understand before we start diving into our different challenges. And then we're going to end with a good summary on what we've learned uh, as we've progressed. So first and foremost, let's start off with the definitions on just the difference between imperative and declarative. So when it comes to the imperative style of, of management, think of this as kind of how you want to do something or you know, coming up with the step-by-step -step instructions on achieving a task or an end result. Now, conversely, on the declarative side, this is more of a description. You're, you're defining what you want the end result to be and letting the tooling go out and do that and make that for you. Then also a good area to understand is the difference on mutable versus immutable infrastructures. So mutable, think of this as something that, that is continuously changing and being updating, like perhaps my laptop. It's something that, that's, you know, it continuously receives updates, patches, uh, different pieces of software. You know, it's always going to be unique. However, you know, just applying a patch is a whole lot faster than laying down an entire new operating system. And that's exactly what immutable infrastructure is because those are managed objects that really don't change. You know, once you deploy it, that's it. There's no troubleshooting. There's no anything like that. If anything wrong happens, you destroy and recreate. Then we have our tooling. Uh, so the most important part through here, because I know a lot of you probably have a good grasp on, on all of these different tools already. We're going to be making use of PowerShell, which is going to be our imperative tooling, and HashiCorp's Terraform, which is going to be our declarative tooling. Now, if you'll notice, each one of these has their own different uh, scripting language, different point of control, uh, as well as a little bit different terminology, even though underneath the covers, they're all basically the same concepts. So with that, let me hand it over to Luke to kick off our first challenge. This first challenge is something that we encounter on a daily basis, most of us. It's how to create a virtual machine. Now, let's dive into some code with this first demo. When you're writing code that is longer than a couple of lines, it is always useful to keep your code organized in such a way that you can visually distinguish between the different parts. In this example, I used regions to group statements that belong together in different sections. So let's start here with the variables. That's where we define a number of values, like for example the name of the VM, but also the resource pool where the VM will be created. Then we have a section preamble where I create a stack. We'll see why I use it later on. And I do some settings for the Power CLI module. Next we connect to the vCenter. And what you see here is a typical example of working in an imperative uh, method. My connection to the vCenter might fail. So what should my script do in that case? So that's why I use the try catch construct here. If the connection to that vCenter fails, we throw an error and we send a message to the user what happened. The VM that we're going to create is created from a template. And for that template, we're going to customize it. And that's why we create an OS customization spec in this section. Next, we locate the resource pool that was requested in the variables earlier on. And then we're finally coming to the actual creation of the VM. Again, a typical example of an imperative method here is that after we create a VM, we're going to check if the VM is actually created before we start changing hardware on that VM. In this case, we're changing the network uh, connection. We're connecting to another port group. When the VM is created, we're starting it. And while we are starting it, we wait till the VMware tools are up and running. That's what we do in this while loop here. And finally, we clean up 
So we throw away that customization spec and we disconnect from the VI server, the vCenter. Now, remember I told you about that stack that I created in the beginning. That's what I do here in this line. Since I'm changing the error action preference, I'm pushing the old value on a stack and I pop it later on to get it back to the original value. It's always a good idea in your scripts to save settings as they were before you change them. That way you don't leave any surprises behind for the next script that you're going to run in this session. Now let's run this. And there we have it. Our VM has been created. As you can see, the VMware tools are running. And the machine got an IP address from the DHCP server running in this environment. Some observations after this first demo. This code that we've seen in the demo is in C sequential. There is some branching in there. There's if then else's. Uh, you have loops where things turn around until a condition is met. And the more important fact in there is that you're the driver. You decide in your coding where the script is going. Remember that try-catch construct that we had to intercept failures of a vCenter connection? That's a typical example where you as a driver decide where the code is going. This code in C is reusable, not in the easiest way, but you can do it with some extra formalism. You can capture everything in functions. You can even put everything in a module that makes it easier to share with your peers and colleagues. Now over to Kyle for the declarative demo. For the second part of this challenge, we're going to be taking a look at the declarative way to provision a virtual machine. And in this case, we're going to be making use of Terraform. And so what we have in front of us right now is what's known as a configuration file or a main.tf. This is just basically a way for us to describe to Terraform what we want our infrastructure to look like as Terraform is going through the provisioning and managing process of those particular objects. So there are a couple things that we need to know about in order to build out a functional configuration file. Uh, first and foremost is the Terraform block. Uh, the important part for this is this is where we tell Terraform the providers that it needs to make use of. This is essentially our way of telling Terraform how to talk to different particular APIs. In this case, we're using the vSphere provider, which we can grab directly from the Terraform registry. Now, once Terraform knows how to talk to uh, these different services, such as vSphere, we have the provider block that tells it exactly, that tells Terraform exactly where to talk uh, and how to authenticate. Then from there, we have some data blocks. These data blocks, think of these as you know, read-only ways to tell Terraform about pieces that already exist in the infrastructure, something like a data center in this case. Uh, then we also have things such as the data store, resource pool, network, folder, all of those parts and pieces that a virtual machine uh, needs to know about in order to run. Uh, as you'll notice as we're going through here, all of these kind of have a dependency on that data center ID. Uh, in order to allow Terraform to really kind of uh, understand where it lives and exists. Down here at the bottom, this is where it gets interesting. So we have a data source that's known as the vSphere Virtual Machine. What we're doing with this is we're pointing that at the template that we would like to clone to create our virtual machine. Then we have a resource block. The resource block is what Terraform actually manages. So here we're establishing a bunch of different arguments that, that make up a virtual machine. Things like name, uh, reusing the resource pool data store and folder, uh, those data sources again to, to tell it exactly where it should live. Then we're making use of that template in order to fully describe out the rest of it, including CPU count, network interface, uh, our, our SCSI interfaces or, or different disks. Then, as we just expanded right there, we have the clone area. This is where we tell it exactly what we want our end result of this virtual machine to be. So from that point, we can jump into what's known as our variables file or variables.tf. This is kind of where we make up um, or define to Terraform what we want specific variables to be. 
Uh, so here we have things like our vSphere user, our vSphere password, our server, uh, and then the names for you know that data store, the resource pool, the network, folder name, uh, all those different parts and pieces. Then down towards the bottom is again where it gets kind of important, where we get to the VM name as well as the template name that we want to use. Now these defaults are just things that, uh, that Terraform will assign automatically. We can change those as we need. So jumping into our terminal, let's actually do some stuff. Let's start off by doing um, a Terraform init. This is what's known as an initialization. This basically reaches out to the Terraform registry, grabs that vSphere provider, uh, and checks a couple different things to make sure that we're ready to use this configuration file. Next up, we have our Terraform plan. This is going to go through and literally create a plan for Terraform to go from, you know, the nothing, assumingly, that's in our infrastructure right now to the end result as we described it. So here we can see all of those different parts and pieces of that virtual machine uh, that we didn't actually describe. It knew about that automatically through some of those defaults. Now the next up, we're going to be making use of the Terraform apply. Here it's actually going to take that plan, output it again, and then ask us, are we sure that we want to perform these actions? So we tell it yes, and then it goes through and shows us an output log of what's happening behind the scenes. So here we can see our virtual machine has started creating, and if we jump into our vSphere environment, we can see that we already have a virtual machine that's been cloned, uh, and it's starting uh, after the customization phase. So if we scroll down a little bit to the guest OS section, uh, we can see that it's running, it's already uh, performing the boot, probably going through that customization phase. And then here shortly, we should hopefully see the DNS name and IP address pop up uh, as what we've configured it to be Automation Summit Demo 01. So there we have our guest OS items populating from the uh, VMware tools or OpenVM tools, uh, whichever you might be using. Returning back to our terminal, we can see that our apply has been completed. It has added that one resource, and it's also given us a set of outputs that we define that might be a little beyond uh, the scope of what we're talking about right now. But we can pull out some information such as the VM tool status and the new virtual machine ID, which is going to be very important uh, for some of the other tasks. So to kind of cover what we went over there, when it comes to the declarative way of doing things such as provisioning a virtual machine, this kind of takes you and puts you into the seat of a designer because you no longer have to worry about those imperative steps of you know walking through the process of clicking through the new VM process. So, but there are some things that you need to understand such as the defaults because we only configured a small portion of that entire list of things that Terraform uh, you know, output as part of our plan process. But we only really need to worry and know the custom values that we're going to need to change. You know, those things such as the virtual machine name, um, or depending on your environment, that might not even be the important part. It might just be where that virtual machine lives in terms of processing memory and networking. So this is reusable as well, which is very nice. So we can move this around and, and do all sorts of things, uh, but you might require some additional definitions or different file structures, and we're going to get into that in a later challenge. Back to you, Luke. The second challenge we're going to look at is how to remove a virtual machine. Now, this is also something that normally belongs to your daily tasks as a virtual environment administrator. Let's have a look at the demo here. In this demo, we tackled the coding a bit differently. What we did here is we actually separated the code and the data. Let me explain. You see that we use a JSON file here, and from that JSON file, we will read the variables. Remember from the first example that we had a region with all our variables? We took that away from our code and we stored it in an external file. Now let's have a look at that JSON file. What we have in here is general information, like the vCenter to which we are connecting, the actual function and the parameters for that function is the removal of two VMs. And then here we have an array in JSON where we specify the names of those two VMs that we're going to remove. Now, back to the code. 
we have a function to read the content of the JSON file. And then with the data that is returned, we're going to do our preamble. We will show later on what that does. And then the main loop of our code is nothing more than running through that array of VMs as we saw in the JSON. And for each of those, we're going to actually remove that VM. The parameters that we also specified in that JSON file are splatted here in this PowerShell variable and passed to the remove VM commandlet. What we also did is Instead of using regions, we now used actual functions to part, do part of the functionality. So the first function that we have is reading that JSON file, which is nothing more than a get content and a convert from JSON to a PowerShell object. And the second one, the preamble function, does a few of the things that we saw in the earlier demo. We are setting some parameters for our PowerCLI environment and we are connecting to our vCenter. Note that we still use that try catch to catch the situation where our vCenter connection should fail. In this case, we have two VMs in our resource pool and we're going to remove them. Let's run this code. Now, this goes quite quickly. As you noticed, the machine, the VMs were first stopped and then removed. Some conclusions after that demo. Code and data are separated in this example. As you noticed, we stored the actual data in a JSON file and the code was a separate PS1 file. Now, what would be the primary reason we do that? That, for example, will allow us to store that PS1 file under source control. And this is one step towards the DevOps environment that we all target in the end. On a side note here, and you probably noticed by now, I do love splatting. It is a very handy way to make a long list of parameters visually pleasing to the eye when you have to pass them to a commandlet. Over to Kyle for the next demo. So for the second part of our second challenge, we're going to take the exact same configuration that we were making use of before, and instead of using apply, we're going to be making use of a new command. So here we're just clearing out from our old session, and now we're going to run what's known as a Terraform destroy. And this does exactly what you think it does. So it's going to go through, it's going to create that plan for all of those different parts and pieces that we defined in our last challenge. And we can see that now we're going to perform a destroy action against our virtual machine as we defined it. So it's going to move all of those uh, arguments and all of those attributes from something over to null. So all we need to do right now is type in yes. So then if we jump into our vSphere environment, we can see that not only did it delete the virtual machine, but it also shut down the guest OS first and then deleted the virtual machine. And just like that, we've cleaned up our environment. So if we go back to our Terraform uh, console here, we can see that, you know, very similar to our plan and apply phase, we see that our destroy was complete and we have that one item, that virtual machine, that now has been destroyed. So we've achieved the full life cycle of our virtual machine. So when it comes to the declarative side on this, you know, really this is one of those steps where, you know, the dependencies are being managed for you. You know, we didn't have to go through and perform multiple steps in order to shut down the, the guest OS. We didn't need to wait on the guest OS to, to sit there, you know, do a, a sleep command of, of some form um, and then delete it. Terraform did all of that for us because it knew about all of those dependencies so that we didn't have to. In our next demo challenge, we're going to look at something similar to the first demo. But this time we're going to look at how to create virtual machines at scale. Meaning we want to create X number of VMs with one script and one set of data. 
Let's have a look at the demo. In this third demo, we are combining some of the concepts that we introduced in demo 1 and demo 2. In fact, we use the external file, the JSON file in this case, to store the actual data that we're going to use in our code. And then what we had in demo 1 in the regions, we now packaged in functions. So you see, we have the original one from the previous demo where we get the JSON file and convert it to a PowerShell object. But then we have all those regions that we saw in demo one, the preamble, uh, remember connecting to the vCenter, including the try catch if something should go wrong with the vCenter connection. We have the function to retrieve the OS customization spec. We have a function to return the resource pool where the VM should be created. And then finally, we have the actual function that will create the VM. And this also includes the condition that we test if the VM is actually created before we actually add network parameters and start the VM. The start VM itself is again in a separate function. And this, same as in the second example, includes again condition code in a while where we wait till the VMware tools are up and running. Now let's have a look at the JSON file. There is again a general section where we specify things like the vCenter to which to connect and also some of the power CLI settings that we're going to define. And then we have again an array. In that array we have multiple entries and in each entry we specify all those variables that we need to create that VM. Remember the first demo where we had those in a region, well now they are setting in this JSON file, which makes it a lot easier to keep that data separate from the actual code we are using. And the second one is done in a similar way. And we can repeat that X number of times in such a JSON file, independent of the code that we are using. Now, the actual code is nothing more than reading that array with VMs here and then in a loop calling our function to create the VM and calling our function to start the VM. Now, let's run this code. As you can see, the first one is already appearing in the resource pool. It will take some time now because we use OS customization. The VM will at least, the guest OS of the VM will at least reboot once to apply those settings that we specify in the OS customization spec. As we can see, both of our VMs have now been created and started. And if you look at the VM, we see that the VMware tools are up and running and that they obtained an IP address from the DHCP and server in this environment. Some observations that we can make after this demo. As we've shown in that code, scaling is definitely possible with imperative code. What is an important concept is to separate your code from your data. This is definitely a concept that you want to achieve when you strive to reach DevOps environments in your uh, company. And also try to make code reusable. You notice that we packaged everything now in functions. Now these functions, the next step could be that we put them all together in a module. And a module makes it a lot easier to share with your colleagues and your peers. Now over to Kyle to see the same demo, but now in a declarative fashion.
some observations that we can make after this demo. As we've shown in that code, scaling is definitely possible with imperative code. What is an important concept is to separate your code from your data. This is definitely a concept that you want to achieve when you strive to reach DevOps environments in your uh, company. And also try to make code reusable. You notice that we packaged everything now in functions. Now these functions, the next step could be that we put them all together in a module. And a module makes it a lot easier to share with your colleagues and your peers. Now over to Kyle to see the same demo, but now in a declarative fashion. So for the declarative part of this last challenge, we're going to kind of go back to our first challenge where I kind of called out and mentioned, you know, about the repeatability of some of these uh, Terraform configuration files and, you know, what happens to file structures and things of that nature and kind of embrace that and use something that's known as Terraform modules. So again, what we have here is our main.tf, our configuration file for how we want to manage some virtual machines at scale. Now again, we have our Terraform block that calls out our vSphere provider. We have our provider block that tells Terraform how to talk to our vCenter server. And then lastly, we come back to this module block. It's very simplified compared to what we've been using in, in the prior challenges. So the important part here is the source. This is where our module is living. Uh, in this case, it's living out in a modules file. Then we're going to use the count uh, function to uh, create multiple virtual machines uh, of this certain type as we've defined it, and then our VM name and template name that we'll be making use of as we scale out. Our variables file also has been um, dramatically simplified as well as a couple new variables, including VM count and VM prefix. Now we can go back to our file structure here and take a look at our module. So here we have, you know, main outputs and variables. Now, if we click on the main uh, configuration file, we can see that this code looks very similar to what we've been using in the past challenges. And that's because it is, it, it's literally the same code that we were using just repeated being referenced as a module, you know, right down to the variables uh, as well. You know, VM name, template name, all of those things are all built in. And this is what kind of adds to the repeatability of using modules, you know, because you, you can take them and share them and reference them in multiple different ways. In this case, we're using a local module. We're going to jump into our terminal session here. We're going to need to read run it because we need to load in that module. As at the top there, you could see the initialization of the module VM at scale. Then we can see the very similar plugin because we had to go out and uh, grab the vSphere provider again. Then we run through the exact same process we, as we ran through in our first challenge, running a Terraform plan. However, instead of just uh, creating that one singular virtual machine, it's now creating four different VMs. Then we can roll directly into running a Terraform apply, and we're going to see the exact same output there. It's create that plan to create those four different virtual machines, and then we can give it a yes, and it's going to kick off and create all four of those virtual machines simultaneously. So here in our vSphere environment, we can see that the, the clone operation is happening four times at the same time. Uh, this is running side by side. And then after those complete, you're going to see some of these being customized and then even powered on. So here I believe our, our Terraform 02 is going to be the first virtual machine in this case to uh, reach the power on state. If we click on that and run down to the guest OS uh, block in here, we can see that after a couple of seconds after it boots up, runs through the, the customization process, uh, then we should see our DNS name now populated with the made by Terraform 02 DNS name. So there's that. We can also see that some of the other virtual machines have now powered on as well. So let's start by clicking on the Terraform 03. And here we can already see that it's been given our DNS name of made by Terraform 03. 
So all of those virtual machines are unique, at least in their operating system name. So now returning back to our terminal, we can see the uh, apply was complete. But what if we want to do, say, six virtual machines? We can actually modify that VM count variable by using a dash var argument and run our plan again. And it's going to know and understand that those initial four virtual machines already exist, and it just needs to add those two new VMs. However, we're kind of running out of time here, so we're not going to actually uh, run through the apply process to that. But we want to clean up our environment because, again, this is lifecycle at scale. So all we need to do is run that Terraform destroy command. It's going to check in with our vCenter environment, verify what's kind of going on and, and what's in existence. Now. Then it's going to create that plan to destroy those four VMs. So now that that's running, if we run back over to our vCenter, we can see that three of those VMs have already been removed. Uh, and then there's our last one, finally making it through the guest OS shutdown uh, and the deletion process. So our terminal does verify that all of those things have run through and applied. Uh, you know, it took one second for three of those virtual machines and nine seconds for, for, the, for the last one. So a couple takeaways from, from the declarative side of these last couple challenges. I mean, really that's, when it comes to infrastructure as code, the scaling part is quite easy. Um, and it adds incredible consistency because once you kind of have your, your infrastructure defined, you know, it's really easy to build on that or scale it out uh, beyond that. And you now have the understanding uh, and confidence that each one of those, in this case, virtual machines are going to be created in the exact same way and as they've been defined. Uh, and building further on that, modules make this so much simpler so that instead of having to understand and define all of those data blocks, we only had to say, hey, this is the module that we wanted to make use of and give it the inputs, those arguments that it needed, such as the VM count, VM name, and the template name. Now, of course, you can also share those modules. There are things such as the module registry that's on the Terraform registry. There's also some other platforms and tools that allow you to make use of private module registries. Uh, but all in all, it, it's very simple and easy to consume some of those things. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Luke because we have one special thing that we want to cover last. We often get the question, where do you run all these scripts? In this appendix, we're going to show you one solution that we find quite interesting. So basically, the question is where to run this. And we're not talking about your day-to-day -day one run scripts that you do for administering your environment. One option is to run it on your workstation. That is fine for a few lines for a one-off script, but those repetitive scripts that you run on a regular interval and that run or can run quite long, you don't want to burden your workstation with that. On top of that, some workstations by corporate policy are shut down in the evening when you go home. So that is not the ideal environment to have those long running scripts running on there. So that one is out. You can install a dedicated server to run scripts. That is nice and that will work. But having a dedicated server has a few other disadvantages. You have to maintain this thing. You have to apply security patches. And on top of that, that dedicated server is probably powered on all the time, while the scripts only run a limited amount of time. So you have a lot of wasted resources in your environment if you have several of these dedicated servers. So let's drop that option as well. What you ideally want is a throwaway box, a machine that you start up when you need it and that exists for as long as your script will be running. Once the script is completed, you throw away that box. That seems to be an ideal solution. And this brings us to this famous pets versus cattle analogy. A funny side remark there, this expression pets versus cattle dates already from 2006 when they were was made by Bill Baker, a PM for SQL servers at Microsoft. Now one possible solution that we quite like is what is called SRS script runtime services for vSphere. And don't be taken away by the vSphere, you can use it for other platforms as well as we will see later on. First of all, this is open source, so the thing is free to run. 
it's based on K8. Uh, it's the new fashion, so you're good on that side as well. And you have REST APIs to interface with the server. That allows you to upload scripts, run scripts, monitor scripts, and return the output from those scripts. A quick schematic. First of all, these servers are deployed by OVA. So that is a general Lyst method of deploying servers. And that will work on several types of platforms as well. This schematic uh, shows you once the server is installed what you can do. You have your SRS client, like I said earlier, you use the REST API to upload, run and retrieve output from scripts. On the server itself, in that OVA uh, and the server you deployed, you have a number of power CLI modules uh, installed and it's based on K8 as we said earlier. Now in the basic layout it targets a vSphere environment, but it is flexible. You can install any PowerShell module on there, so you can use it for whatever functionality you have are using in your scripts. And on top of that you can target any platform that you like. It's not limited to vSphere only. So definitely have a look at that SRS and give it a try. It's an ideal solution for working with this pets versus cattle concept that is such a great DevOps concept in the end. Some takeaways from the session here. With the imperative method that puts you in the driver's seat, you do the coding, you decide in the coding where it goes. Remember the try catch, uh, the if then else's, that's you driving the code where it goes. And on the declarative side, this makes you the designer or the architect, if you will, of the infrastructure and resources that are under management. But in the end, just use what works best for you in your situation, because you are going to know that a whole lot better than either one of us are. And, you know, when it comes to the declarative side, no matter how much you may want to use it, there are there can be some challenges to adopting declarative approaches in existing environments. Uh, so, you know, maybe consider taking small steps to get to that point if that's what you so choose. One other key concept here is try your best to separate the code from the data. Not only does this allow you to apply, you know, industry or organizational wide standards to your code, but it can also make it highly portable so that you can apply this in several different areas around your organization or even share it with the wider community uh, so that everybody can get better from that code. And it allows you to make your data be unique and secure in the way of how it's applied and input into uh, the code that you've created. And finally, use version control if you have it at your disposal. It allows you to take small increments in changes and fall back if something doesn't work. When it's there, use it. You will definitely profit from it. Thanks for attending the session.